fabulous. That is what Karen C. said about skin, hair, and nails from Heart and Soil Supplements. Listen to this. These reviews we get from, from Heart and Soil are amazing, especially on hair, skin, and nails. I can't say enough about this supplement. The glow is apparent and an odd and transient skin condition I had related to allergies on my face is gone. My nails look terrific and grow fast. Plus, you get the additional benefits of liver and bone marrow. I will continue to use this product. I'll continue to recommend to my clients and health coach and my health coaching practice. Thank you, Heart and Soil. But then we've got this other one. The title is amazing. Also on hair, skin, and nails from Adrian B, who says, I had really bad eczema, just like me, Paul. I had eczema too. He's this person, Adrian, it's a guy or a girl, has been cutting out seed oils and processed sugars, starting to eat meat and fruits a lot more and taking heart and soil, skin, hair, and nails every day. Haven't had to use eczema cream in about a week. My skin is finally looking normal. Thanks, Doc. Look, skin, hair, and nails is a really cool supplement. It has trachea and scapula cartilage, different than most hydrolyzed collagen. These have been studied by John Pruden. He was a surgeon. Uh, and he studied them for wound healing. There's probably special peptides in there. We don't fully understand. It's one of these interesting things in nutrition and medicine, but these trachea and scapular cartilage we use intentionally in hair, skin, and nails to get those wound healing benefits. And eliminating seed oils, processed sugars will probably help with your eczema. If you have other issues with your face or your skin and wound healing, get out in the sun. But check us out at heartandsoil.co to get skin, hair, and nails or any of our other organ, desiccated organ supplements. They're all grass-fed, grass-finished, New Zealand source, the finest on the planet in glass bottles because plastic is bullshit. We try and limit it as much as possible. Heartandsoil.co. Reclaim your birthright to optimal health. That's what's about. Uh, on this week's podcast, talk about why I quit keto a while ago. It's not a new thing, but I want to talk about pros and cons of keto. There's a couple of pros and a lot of cons in my opinion. So I share a little of my story in the beginning. I talk about where I've come from with all my dietary stuff, my own eczema, which got a lot better when I cut out vegetables. Uh, but I wish I had known about organs earlier. And then I talk about the pros of a ketogenic diet. Then I go into why I'm not a fan of a ketogenic diet at all, at all, at all anymore now. And I think most of you, all of you, homo sapiens, humans in general, will get the benefits of a ketogenic diet in other ways, which I describe in this podcast. Then I talk about the damaging things about a ketogenic diet. And I talk about differences between fruit and honey and sugar. And I talk about why glycemic index, glycemic load, are not something to worry about, in my opinion, show some studies on that. So enjoy this podcast on why I quit keto. And hopefully in the future, I'll have some uh, some folks on the podcast to talk about this live. We tried with a few folks and the scheduling didn't work out. So hopefully it'll happen in the future with some, some good uh, open conversation because that's how we share and we learn. On to the podcast, guys. Love you all. Many of you know most of my dietary story. But for those who may not, I will summarize it at the beginning of this podcast because my dietary story ties in very closely to why I am not a fan of ketogenic diets for humans. So most of you know that I was a PA, I was a physician assistant in cardiology for four years. Then I ended up going back to medical school at the University of Arizona. Before I was a PA, I was a vegan. I was very skinny, 20 pounds, 25 pounds of lean muscle mass, less. Couldn't get a date because I was so skinny. Uh, ultimately, with that, I was trying to fix my eczema. And I thought without much consideration of the nutritional literature that that was an ideal diet for humans. Um, I think my experiences and the experiences of most people on a vegan diet that is not full of synthetic processed protein powders and a cabinet full of supplements clearly illustrate that a vegan diet it's bullshit for humans, no matter what homo sapien individual you are, and results, in bad res and results in bad outcomes for us as a species. Next, I went paleo. And I was paleo for probably the 10 years that followed. My eczema continued to occur from time to time. Various things triggered it, probably non-raw dairy, probably chocolate. Beans appeared to be a trigger. I would also get reflux when I would eat beans. And I had one of the worst outbreaks in my life of eczema when I was trying to include medicinal mushrooms, rag, uh, chaga, reishi, cordyceps, and lion's mane in my diet as powders. At that point, I got kind of fed up with where I was. And I thought, okay, look, I'm eating foods on a paleo diet that are supposed to be healthy for me, yet I'm still having eczema. So I went carnivore. Carnivore, just meat, organs, fat, and salt for two years. That fixed the eczema, resulted in improvements in psychological function, mental clarity, 
emotional stability that I didn't expect. But after one and a half to two years, I began to experience some problems related to a strictly carnivore diet. And I think a lot of people do with ketogenic diets that are either carnivore or more mainstream ketogenic diets that might include things like nuts or vegetables or whatever, but limit carbohydrates in the same way as a carnivore diet. Might be lower protein than a carnivore diet, but nevertheless on a carnivore diet. I was definitely in ketosis a lot of the time. I had a ketone meter that I would prick my finger with and I would see ketones of 1.5 to 2 all the time. So even though I was eating a lot of protein on a carnivore diet, I was clearly in ketosis. After a year and a half to two years, I began to have pretty difficult to ignore muscle cramps, sleep disturbances, middle of the night insomnia, waking up with palpitations and a racing heart, uh, cramps when I was climbing and rock gyms that were pretty significant, cold all the time. We'll talk about that later in the podcast, probably related to thyroid stuff from long-term ketosis or moderate-term ketosis for humans. And when I looked at my hormones, they were declining. At the beginning of a carnivore diet, my total testosterone was probably seven to 800, which is where it is now that I'm not on a ketogenic diet, but over the course of a carnivore diet, it declined 600, 500 into the mid, I think upper 400s at one time was probably the nadir for my testosterone. Similarly, I saw my sex hormone binding globulin go up, up, up over 120. I talked about this on a podcast with Derek from More Plates, More Dates. And I talked about it on last week's podcast where, where I showed my recent from July, 2020, blood work. So if you want to know what my blood work looks like now on an animal-based diet, go to that podcast. But so here I am interested in the carnivore diet, interested in the way that dietary changes can affect humans positively and may be a very powerful therapy for autoimmune disease and chronic disease for humans. But the dietary strategy that I'm thinking is good or that I'm doing a carnivore diet, the dietary strategy that I wrote a book about um, wasn't totally working for me. So at that point I had to kind of pivot and think about what I was missing. Clearly I was missing carbohydrates and also vegetables. I don't think it was the exclusion of broccoli that caused me to have those issues, but I did begin to realize that perhaps adding back carbohydrates to my diet could improve some of those issues, especially when I found data that I'll share later in this podcast about the important actions of insulin at the level of the kidney for electrolyte maintenance and preservation of those electrolytes, things like sodium, potassium, magnesium, calcium, et cetera. That's later in the podcast. So when I thought about that, I decided to add back honey first and then fruit, thinking, okay, these are the least toxic ways I can get carbohydrates. I didn't really want to add potatoes. They're a nightshade. They have all sorts of issues. I've spoken about that separately. I didn't want to add back grains. Grains are seeds. They have lots of defense chemicals. They have gluten. They have mold problems with most grains. They have digestive enzyme inhibitors. Oats are high in phytic acid. I've spoken about why I'm not a fan of grains like wheat or oats or roots like potatoes specifically as a carbohydrate source. For a, a few weeks, I experimented with white rice. Perhaps this is the least toxic grain. I don't eat white rice anymore, but the vegan community love to point out that I was eating rice for a little while. And there are lots of videos made about Paul Saladino quits the carnivore diet and now eats rice as I was exploring things. I guess in vegan communities, you're not allowed to think about things and, and explore uh, and uh, try things. Um, it's quite a dogmatic community, as is, uh, as are some factions of other diets, like a carnivore diet can get fairly dogmatic as well. So I added back fruit and honey. And as you guys all know, I got super fat and insulin resistant. And that was a problem. No, that's a joke. I didn't get either of those things. I got more muscular. My muscles became more full. My cramps went away. My heart palpitations went away. My sleep got better. My testosterone is now back above 700 with a sex hormone binding globulin. That is uh, between 60 and 65 most of the time still higher than most reference ranges for an SHBG, probably because I'm very insulin sensitive and that will affect sex hormone binding globulin. Uh, when you are extremely insulin sensitive, and even though I'm eating a lot of carbohydrates now, I've spoken about this, I eat 200 plus grams of carbohydrates now per day from fruit and honey. I'll talk about why I don't worry about those and why they are different than sucrose later in this podcast, but my fasting insulin remains 2.4 and my hemoglobin A1C is 5.2 if you saw my last podcast, 5.2 or 5.4. I think it's 5.2. Anyway, average blood glucose for me over the last 90 days, 103 milligrams per deciliter. So eating honey and fruit did not make me insulin resistant. What it did do was improve all of the problems I had run into on a ketogenic diet. So that was the beginning of my, let's just say skepticism 
regarding ketogenic diets. As I was doing a ketogenic diet, many people had reached out to me and said, hey, this probably isn't the right way to do it. But I am a person who understands both sides of the issue because there are benefits to a ketogenic diet, which I will explain in a moment. And when I was in the fully carnivore phase, I was reading a lot of the studies showing benefits to a, a ketogenic diet and felt like I was okay. Eventually, I did change course for the better. Now, being open-minded is a good thing. I think we should all strive for that. I've always been honest and open with all of you about my course with the dietary stuff, which is why when I wrote the cookbook, um, we made it animal-based with fruit and honey and some lower toxicity sources of carbohydrates. And perhaps in the future, I'll go back and write a second edition of the Carnivore Code, where I talk about things I got right in that book and maybe a few things that I want to adjust about my thinking when I wrote the Carnivore Code. I still think a lot of what I was considering and imagining and thinking about when I wrote the Carnivore Code holds true. The problems with vegetables, the fact that these are maybe not good for all humans, uh, the fact that seeds are probably not good for humans, the fact that a lot of roots are probably not great for humans either, and the fact that meat and organs should form the center of any human's diet, any member of the species Homo sapiens that wants to thrive, these are all things that are this core of the carnivore code, the book. Now, are there things I would change about it and adjust? Yes, I've continued to grow and evolve. Maybe a second edition will come in the future. As many of you know, now I eat an animal-based diet. What does my diet look like now? You can see every single day on my stories on Instagram at carnivoremd2.0. Uh, if you don't follow me there, uh, uh, go check it out. I don't know what you're doing with your life if you don't follow me there. Um, it's organs, either fresh or desiccated, like heart and soil supplements. Super proud of that company that I built. And in the month of August, we are doing an Animal Based 30. Go to animalbased30.com to sign up for that. It's free with heart and soil supplements, tons of resources. We get people excited about this 30-day challenge. Lives change with this Animal Based 30. So I get organs, either fresh or desiccated. I have meat, I have fruit, I have honey, and I have raw dairy. That's what I think of as an animal-based diet. That's the term that I created to sort of hold to frame that way of eating. And I think it's somewhere between a carnivore diet and a paleo diet doesn't have things like vegetables, which are leaves and stems and roots and seeds of plants. But I think it does include sources of carbohydrates, which are very helpful for humans. So that is my journey and my experience. Now, when I started talking about this, so many who reached out to me, we get so many emails at Heart and Soil because we have a team of health coaches there that helps people for free in terms of like navigating animal-based diets and their, their dietary stuff, um, getting more organs, however they want to in their diet. And so many people reached out saying, oh, I'm doing jujitsu. I'm feeling lethargic. What do we say? Add more carbohydrates. They come back. Oh, it helps so much. So we heard this over and over. The anecdotes are astounding, but the anecdotes are just the beginning. There's a lot of research to back this up. Now, that's why I'm not a fan of ketogenic diet. I had hoped that and all this research that I'm going to show you I had hoped to do this podcast with either Ken Berry or Thomas DeLauer. Um, I'm planning to get both of them on the podcast in the future to have meaningful discussion. This podcast is in no way, or shape, or form any sort of personal attack on anyone. Um, I think it's important to be able to discuss ideas in an unbiased, in a reasonable way. And I appreciate that both of those guys are willing to do that. We just haven't been able to make it happen. Um, so in the future, hopefully Ken Berry and Thomas DeLauer will come on and we will have some more discussion about pros and cons of ketogenic diets, maybe pros and cons of fruit. Maybe those guys will enlighten me uh, as to why I should not be included fruit and honey in my diet. But these are ideas that I'm discussing today and hopefully we'll be able to do that with those guys in the future. I wanna move into the next phase of this podcast, starting with the benefits of a ketogenic diet. Why would you do a ketogenic diet? So I think there are two clear benefits to a ketogenic diet. These being intractable epilepsy, there's very good data that in children or adults with epilepsy, uh, a ketogenic diet can be quite helpful. And there's some reasonable data that in those with neurodegenerative disorders, Parkinson's, perhaps Alzheimer's, diseases in which we know the mitochondria are broken and in which, to be frank, pyruvate dehydrogenase and glucose metabolism may be broken for some reason or another, bypassing that with beta oxidation and fatty acid oxidation seems to improve 
mental functioning for a lot of people. So if you have a brain disorder, whether it's severe epilepsy, whether it's Parkinson's, whether it's Alzheimer's, I think using ketogenic diets as an adjunctive treatment to kind of bypass the main energy system that the human body uses, that being the glucose energy system through pyruvate dehydrogenase um, is a benefit, okay? Second thing, I do think that when you are in ketosis and you have beta-hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate, in some sort of an equilibrium in your blood, there's good evidence that that will quell appetite. I think a lot of diets fail because they don't address appetite. I think the success of a ketogenic diet has been because of the ways that it addresses appetite. Now, I'll be very quick to say, I don't think this is the best way to address appetite, and I'll explain that in a moment. But if you are in ketosis, your appetite appears to be lower based on the research. I think this is why a ketogenic diet works for people because it controls appetite and why many diets fail. Weight watchers, uh, if it fits your macros, counting calories, these fail long-term because they will do nothing to address your appetite. And you will put yourself in a calorie restricted prison, which your body after millions of years of pre-hominid and hundreds of thousands of years of human evolution will break out of, I assure you. So how does a ketogenic diet affect appetite? There's a couple of studies which I think point to the mechanisms here, which are interesting to address with the asterisk, the caveat being, and I will explain this in a moment, that I don't think this is the best way to control your appetite. So you can see here in this study, the effects of a high protein ketogenic diet on hunger, appetite, and weight loss in obese men feeding ad libitum, which means they let these guys eat as much as they wanted, as long as it was ketogenic. They said in the short term, high protein, low carbohydrate ketogenic diets reduce hunger, Lower food intake significantly more than do high protein, medium carbohydrate, non ketogenic diets. So there's something going on here with appetite, which can be beneficial. But again, there are better ways to do this. And that will be the takeaway from this part of the podcast. Just keep, stay with me here. Um, next study I want to show you is looking at a ketone ester and levels of ghrelin. So ghrelin is a hunger hormone in humans. And you can see that increased blood levels of ketones directly suppress appetite. Uh, they had a ketone ester drink. This is not nutritional ketosis. They lowered plasma ghrelin levels, perceived hunger, and desire to eat. This is probably one of the major mechanisms by which a ketogenic diet or supplemental ketones, either ketone esters or ketone salts, will lower perceived hunger and desire to eat because there is a normal hormone in humans called ghrelin that makes us hungry. Okay? So, why do I think this is not addressing the root cause? Or why do I think this is not the best way to fix your appetite? I want to direct your attention to a podcast I did with Tucker Goodrich where we talked about a drug called Ramonaband. It was never approved in the United States, but it is an obesity drug that was approved for a short amount of time in Europe. It's an inverse agonist of the CB1 receptor in humans, meaning that it's essentially, at the end of the day, going to block the cannabinoid 1 receptor in humans. Now, what does blocking a cannabinoid receptor in humans do? It creates less hunger. It blocks our impulse at hunger and people lose weight. Great, miracle drug, right? Not so fast. There was an increased rate of suicide with this drug. Apparently, the human body uses drugs in an elegant, complex fashion and simply blocking a receptor doesn't always result in only the desired effect that we want. This is this problem with side effects of all molecules, something I've talked about in the past many times. So Ramona Bayant was never approved in the States. We don't need people having more suicidal ideation. But the mechanism is what is illustrative here. The fact that if you block the CB1 receptor, if you block the cannabinoid system in the human brain, that you can get people to eat less. Okay. Is the reverse true? If you activate the cannabinoid system in the human brain, will people eat more? Yes. This is what happens with the munchies when you smoke marijuana. There are cannabinoids in marijuana, whether it's THC, cannabidiol, or others. And there are endogenous cannabinoids in our system, uh, like anandamide, that activate these receptors. Those receptors don't exist just so that the marijuana smoke compounds can tickle them when you smoke marijuana, but marijuana is tapping into your endogenous inside of your body, the system of cannabinoids. We know that blocking one of those receptors with the inverse agonist Ramonaband leads you to eat less. And if you activate that receptor, it can lead you to eat more. There are drugs that do the opposite that are used for cancer cachexia, they are given to people to get them to eat more and they will activate those receptors. Sometimes they even give people actual cannabinoids to do this, to get them to eat more uh, when they have cachexia, which is wasting from cancer. Where am I going with this? 
The really interesting piece of this is that polyunsaturated fatty acids in animal models break down into a compound named 2-AG that can also stimulate those receptors. So here's a study. Dietary linoleic acid, which is the molecule you guys have heard me talk about all the time, elevates endogenous 2-AG and anandamide. That's that other cannabinoid that's endogenous and induces obesity. Again, this is in mice, but I believe the same thing could be happening in humans. So what I want to suggest here, the hypothesis that I would advance is that you are hungry because you are eating polyunsaturated fatty acids, because you are eating junk. You are hungry because you are insulin resistant. You are hungry because you are tickling the cannabinoid receptors in your brain as along with other things. That is why you are hungry. You can decrease ghrelin with ketones, but the real way, I think the best way for humans to decrease their hunger is to clean up your freaking diet. Food quality matters. Carbohydrates are not the reason that you are hungry. Ketones will decrease ghrelin. There are other ways to mitigate your appetite. And those are things like an animal-based diet. You cut out processed sugars, which may affect hunger through a different mechanism that is beyond the scope of this podcast. And you cut out seed oils and you limit those linoleic acid byproducts, 2-AG and anandamide, at least in animal models. I think this is going to happen in humans too. And you will be less hungry. And you will have the benefits, the benefits of the insulin. And yes, I'll explain this later in the podcast. That comes after you eat carbohydrates. You will have the benefits of carbohydrates because I think that carbohydrates are clearly beneficial for humans. Can you have your cake, quote unquote, and eat it too? Yes, except your cake is made from fruit and honey. It's not made from grains or seed oils or processed sugars or white potatoes or rice or oats. Get it. You guys get it. Okay. So that's what I'm driving at here is that yes, controlling appetite is critical. I do not think a ketogenic diet is the only way to do that. I think the better way to control your appetite is to think very clearly and very intentionally and to act very intentionally with regard to food quality. This is why I'm not a fan of counting calories, if it fits your macros, Weight Watchers. If you don't address food quality, you will never address hunger. You will never address satiety. There are many in the nutrition space who would advance ideas that you can eat whatever you want as long as X. And those conditions can be things like, it doesn't spike your blood sugar above a certain level, and I'll talk about why I disagree with that. Or as long as it fits your macros, as long as it doesn't increase your calories too much. I've spoken on other podcasts and previously about why those think those things, those ideas are wrong because we know that not all calories are created equally. There are many good studies to suggest that certain fatty acids, those being polyunsaturated omega-6 fatty acids like linoleic acid, affect your physiology essentially in an endocrine-like way differently than other fats. If not all calories are the same, if calories from honey are not the same as calories from sucrose, table sugar, or Coca-Cola, then we have a burgeoningly complex, interesting world of nutrition in which reductionism is death and reductionism will mislead us. And those are all things that I try and advance consistently in my work. The idea that Coca-Cola is not the same as honey, that's this podcast, that seed oils are not the same as animal fats and we should be careful because these will affect hunger in different ways. The key to your weight loss is fixing your hunger. You can do that by depriving yourself of carbohydrates and their benefits, which I'll talk about later in this podcast, or you can eliminate what I believe is the ultimate root cause, which is the seed oils. Choice is yours. But this is what I would advance. This is the hypothesis that I will advance. Weight loss is a deficiency of polyunsaturated fatty acids, especially omega-6 linoleic acid. You do that, you limit that in your diet, and you will lose weight. We'll see. So now that we've talked about potential benefits of a ketogenic diet, let's move on to what I see as dangers of a ketogenic diet, which will be a discussion also of the benefits of carbohydrates. And then the inference will be that these are the benefits that you will lose when you remove them from your diet. At the risk of getting a little technical, which I will do a few times in this podcast, let's start with an intuitive approach. If you look at human physiology, glucose controls insulin and vice versa. So the hormone insulin controls the metabolism 
of the substrate, but glucose levels also control hormones involved in fatty acid breakdown, this being the process of ketosis by which your fat is broken down via beta oxidation. To me and to others, this suggests that ketosis is a state of urgency rather than the default mechanism or the homeostatic state for humans. This is really important to understand. Glucose controls the metabolism of itself, but also ketones. Ketones, fatty acids don't control their own metabolism. If you don't eat enough fatty acids, your body won't go into ketosis. Your body won't break down fat because you're not eating enough fatty acids. But if you don't eat enough glucose, your body will then react by creating more ketones, breaking down fatty acids, et cetera. So I think there's information built into the way that our systems function that gives us a sense of this idea that a state of ketosis is the urgent program for humans, a state of starvation, a state of carbohydrate deficit, which we are always trying to get out of. The body also goes to great lengths to avoid ketosis. We know that if you're on a carnivore diet that's strict, meaning organs, meat, salt, fat, and you have a lot of protein, that will also kick you out of ketosis. There are ketogenic amino acids. There are uh, amino acids that are not ketogenic, but there are many amino acids that can be made into ketones. This is why high protein diets, extremely high protein diets, sometimes keep people out of ketosis. So the body is using everything it can to avoid going into ketosis. And the control of glucose, insulin versus fatty acids and their attendant hormones, those being catecholamines and cortisol, which are the original hormones that are going to be elaborated within the human body, when you deprive yourself of glucose and carbohydrates that will lead to ketosis, there's an, in, there's an asymmetry there that I think tells us what the programming of the human organism is. Beyond that, let's start with the kidney and the actions of insulin in terms of electrolyte maintenance, which I think is the single biggest problem for a lot of people. There's a lot of reasons a ketogenic diet is not a good thing for humans, but let's start with this mechanism of insulin at the level of the kidney. When I was doing a ketogenic diet, I didn't understand this and nobody ever showed it to me. I only found it after the fact and I thought, aha, this makes so much sense. Why wasn't I taught this in medical school? Why didn't I understand this? Why doesn't anyone talk about this? The overarching theme of the next few points will be that insulin is beneficial for humans. That when you eat carbohydrates, things like fruit or honey, you do have a postprandial insulin spike. Some would fear that. I would say that is beneficial. That is the reason your kidneys are holding on to electrolytes. That is the reason you do not have electrolyte problems. That is going to trigger changes in your hormones, which are beneficial, changes in sex hormone binding globulin, as I hinted at earlier, which are beneficial, all sorts of positive changes, changes in glutathione, which are beneficial, come from that postprandial insulin spike. Too much insulin is a bad thing, but too much insulin, I believe, results from pathologic insulin resistance, which is almost never caused by excess insulin in humans. I think that a lot of people in the ketogenic space believe that insulin resistance comes from excess insulin. And I would say, no, I have not seen convincing evidence of that in humans. Look at me. I am eating 200, perhaps 300 grams of carbohydrates some days. I have a lot of insulin postprandially. I'm extremely insulin sensitive, as insulin sensitive as anyone on a ketogenic diet or anyone on a carnivore diet. Why is insulin not inducing insulin resistance in me? Because insulin doesn't cause insulin resistance in normal human physiology. I would say that other than laboratory situations where someone is hooked up to an insulin drip, it is essentially impossible to get insulin-induced insulin resistance in a human outside of a laboratory setting. These laboratory derangements are possible, but no human, the worst human on the planet is not drinking Coca-Cola 24 hours a day. Perhaps there's somebody out there somewhere, but that's essentially what you'd have to do. Drink Coca-Cola and only Coca-Cola and wash it down with other processed sugar all the time to get the amount of insulin that is simulated by a laboratory insulin drip to create insulin-induced insulin resistance. 
Someone eating Twinkies a few times a day, something I'm not a fan of, is not going to create insulin-induced insulin resistance. I think that the vast majority, 98 plus percent of insulin resistance, aka metabolic dysfunction, is caused by metabolic arrangements related to seed oils, those being excess linoleic acid in the human organism that destroy our metabolism. I've talked about that on other podcasts in great depth. So let's establish this piece. Carbohydrates, especially fruit and honey, do not cause insulin-induced insulin resistance in humans. Insulin has benefits. I'll show you some differences between sucrose and fruit and honey later in the podcast. But let's go to the benefits of insulin that you will never hear about in the ketogenic community at the level of the kidney. Insulin's impact on renal sodium transport and blood pressure in health, obesity and diabetes. Insulin has been shown to have anti-natriuretic actions in humans and animal mammals. Natriuresis, Naturesis is the loss of electrolytes in the kidney, okay? So the majority of renal sodium transporters are controlled by insulin in the kidney. Several groups using primary cell culture have demonstrated that insulin can directly increase activity of the epithelium sodium channel, the sodium phosphatase cotransporter, the sodium hydrogen exchanger type 3, and the sodium potassium ATPase, et cetera, et cetera. So insulin is well-known have critical actions in the kidney. When I was on a ketogenic carnivore diet, no amount of electrolytes, no amount of salt, magnesium, or potassium. Believe me, I tried. I tried way too much potassium orally a couple of times. It's very dangerous. Do not do that. Could resolve my electrolyte deficiencies because I had no signaling in the kidney to hold on to those things. You can help a little bit by giving yourself salt, especially if you're doing a fast, which is a whole separate podcast. But once you get over a few days of ketogenic diet or fasting, your electrolytes are not going to be fixed by supplementation with any amount of electrolytes. I think that is the wrong thing for humans to be doing. I know people who were doing 20 plus grams of salt per day and still had issues. It's not the way to fix it. You have a sieve. Your kidneys are losing sodium. When you lose sodium, you're losing potassium. When you lose potassium, you're losing magnesium and chloride and calcium. All the electrolytes get out of whack. How do you fix it? Don't fear insulin, get good carbohydrates, and you will fix this issue. So that is the first major issue that I have with the ketogenic diet. And I look forward to talking to Ken Berry and Tom DeLauer about this. The second major issue I have is sex hormone binding globulin and free hormones. I've seen it in myself. I've seen it in many others. I've looked at blood work of sex hormone binding globulin goes through the roof on long-term ketogenic diets. It does. There's no insulin postprandially. That leads to much lower levels of free hormones and my total levels of testosterone along with my free testosterone went down as my SHBG, my sex hormone binding globulin went up. As I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, you can go back to my previous week's podcast with a blood work review, the July, 2022 blood work review. If you want to know what my testosterone is now, what my SHBG is now relative to previous ones, I've spoken about it in the past on podcasts. I won't belabor that here. But we know that insulin has beneficial actions by lowering SHBG. As I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, my sex hormone binding globulin remains slightly above the reference range, but about half of what it has been in the past, which results in much higher levels of free androgens, which are good for all sorts of things, muscle mass, libido, all kinds of things beneficial there. So that's a critical action of insulin as well. Moving on insulin appears to be involved in the formation of glutathione, the main antioxidant in the human body. These are the benefits of insulin. Getting a postprandial insulin spike appears to have benefit in terms of overall antioxidant status in a human, primarily glutathione. Consider this study, intensive insulin therapy increases glutathione synthesis rate in surgical ICU patients with stress hyperglycemia. So basically what they're saying is when they give people a whole bunch of insulin, Glutathione goes up uh, when you have really sick surgical ICU patients. The same thing appears to happen in normal humans as well. We know that glutathione metabolism in type 2 diabetes is impaired. That's not surprising because in type 2 diabetes, you have insulin resistance. You may have hyperinsulinemia, but lower actions of insulin in the human body. And I think this absence of glutathione production because of the absence of insulin signaling is one of the main things leading to microvascular complications 
and hyperglycemia. I think this could also be at the root of increased rates, or I should say the uh, beginnings of atherosclerosis in diabetics. This is where oxidative stress in diabetes comes from. You don't have enough glutathione, you get oxidative stress. You can have all the insulin in the world in your body, but if your cells are not seeing insulin at the receptors because you have pathologic insulin resistance, you won't get that signal for glutathione. It's very clear that this is a good thing. So some insulin signaling, very beneficial in humans uh, who are insulin sensitive. Also want to show this study, glycine increases insulin sensitivity and glutathione biosynthesis and protects against oxidative stress in a model of sucrose-induced insulin resistance. So you can give people glycine, which is one of the three amino acids in glutathione, and it actually improves insulin sensitivity. And then you can make more glutathione. But the key takeaway is that insulin is essential for glutathione synthesis. And the caveat or the corollary there is the question, have we looked at glutathione levels in people on ketogenic diets? Have we looked at glutathione levels in people who are fasting, who have very low insulin? Is it possible they're lower? Who knows? Possibly. We know glutathione is critical. I recently did a video on YouTube about hormesis, sauna versus broccoli. You can hear a lot about glutathione in that video as well. Moving on with why I'm not a fan of ketogenic diets. You can consider uh, anecdotes like this. Renal stone associated with a ketogenic diet in a five-year-old girl with intractable epilepsy. I do think that there is something going on here and that um, there is a potential for a ketogenic diet to impair bone health. A short-term ketogenic diet impairs markers of bone health in response to exercise. And um, there is a uh, potential for low-grade metabolic acidosis in ketogenic diets, potentially contributing to these renal stones, loss of calcium, et cetera. So there's, there's a lot going on here that could be negative. I don't think this is the optimal state for humans. Um, this article I find sort of comical. I add it just as a, a bit of context. The prevalence of micronutrient deficiency in popular diets, they compared Atkins for life, which is essentially a ketogenic diet, South Beach, Beach diet, and the DASH diet. And I thought it was interesting that all of them <laughs> had significant micronutrient deficiencies. So some people would say, oh, a ketogenic diet has nutrient deficiencies. Well, guess what? <laughs> Every diet you look at is going to have micronutrient deficiencies. I'm sure if they had uh, a Mediterranean diet on here, they would find micronutrient deficiencies. I think this speaks to a broader issue, which is the fact that the way that we look at nutrients is flawed. And it is very interesting to try and reverse engineer a diet based on the nutrients we know humans need. And there's a lot to, there's a lot to unpack there. Uh, the way we calculate nutrients is a little funny in some nutrients. Uh, the way that we look at them in foods, K1 versus K2 confusion, and the fact that we're not even considering bioavailability um, clearly, you guys are familiar with my work. You know that I think most of these plant nutrients are very poorly bioavailable. I'm not saying a ketogenic diet is necessarily nutrient poor. If you included organs on your ketogenic diet, it could be pretty nutrient rich. But uh, I think it's a topic for another podcast where we get our micronutrients from and trying to reverse uh, engineer a diet based on the nutrients we know humans need, I think is a fascinating rabbit hole to go down. Now, some people would say, well, Paul, we know ketogenic diets are better for weight loss. Not really. If you look at meta-analyses like this one, which I think is the most comprehensive one, although it was done in 2006, um, ketogenic diets were at least as effective as low-fat, energy-restricted diets for up to one year. And anyone who says they're better, if you look at one year, they start to converge. So I'm not convinced that a ketogenic diet is going to lead to more weight loss than any other type of diet that is limiting calories. Um, the, although they say this is a non-energy restricted uh, diet, so they're presuming some uh, eucaloric diets. Um, although they say these are non-energy restricted diets, they're at least as effective as low-fat energy restricted diets. But at one year, uh, these do converge. And so as I spoke about in the beginning of the podcast, I think the issue here is satiety. And there's only so long you can suppress that ghrelin in a human uh, before you end up with other problems from not having enough postprandial insulin signaling, things like hormonal changes, electrolyte changes, which can be quite severe. Uh, I think the way to fix weight loss, the way to fix weight loss, I cannot overemphasize this point. I cannot emphasize this point enough. The way to create weight loss is to improve food quality by eliminating seed oils because of the mechanisms I outlined earlier.
Let's continue further down the rabbit hole of why I'm not a fan of ketogenic diets. Um, let's look at T3 and thyroid markers. This is something that happens to essentially everyone I've seen on a ketogenic diet. Their T3 goes low. Their thyroid hormones get a little bit wonky. And though we're not entirely sure what this means, our, is receptor sensitivity changes? Is receptor sensitivity changing? Um, I just can't ignore this any longer. Isocaloric carbohydrate deprivation, ketogenic diet, induces protein catabolism. Not a good thing. Despite a low T3 syndrome in healthy men, you don't want a low T3, guys. T3 is linked to metabolism. T3 is linked to basal metabolic rate. T3 is linked to your hormones. And according to this study, you're getting uh, protein catabolism, loss of muscle, but they are noting that there is decreased T3 syndrome in humans when you restrict ketogenic, when you restrict carbohydrates on a ketogenic diet. I am, this is just clearly demonstrated over and over and over in the research. And anyone who's done this, if you look at their thyroid labs, you will see that they are, they're out of whack. Their T3 is low. These resolved and improved uh, for me significantly. You can see my blood work podcast from last week when I included carbohydrates back in my diet. Now my TSH was never off, which is why it's like a eucaloric sick syndrome, something we don't really fully understand in medicine. The body doesn't want to push the TSH too high, perhaps because it thinks you're starving, doesn't want the metabolic rate to go too high because it thinks you're searching for food, but there's something different about restricting carbohydrates in the thyroid and it doesn't look good. That was probably why I was always a little cold in San Diego. Got better when I moved to other places that were much colder at certain times of the year, like Texas, um, but my thyroid hormones improved. So uh, this is an interesting one. The influence of dietary carbohydrate intake on the free testosterone to cortisol ratio responses to short-term intensive exercise training. This is a 2010 paper. Basically what it shows is that when you give carbohydrates, the changes in post-exercise free testosterone to cortisol look way better. The findings suggest that if the free testosterone to cortisol ratio is utilized as a marker of training stress or imbalance, it is necessary for a moderately high diet of carbohydrate to be consumed to maintain validity of any observed changes in the ratio value because that ratio changes significantly in a negative way when the low carbohydrate uh, diets were tried. So what they're saying here is that on a low carbohydrate diet, at least in this study, short-term intensive exercise training resulted in more decline in testosterone, more increase in cortisol. I wish people would use this ratio more, this testosterone, free testosterone to cortisol ratio. I don't really care what your testosterone is if your cortisol is through the roof too, which is overtraining. But in the past, I believe in some Olympic camps and places they have used this free testosterone to cortisol ratio to tell people when they were ready to continue training. I wish it were something that were easier to check on us. Imagine if there were a, uh, like a continuous glucose monitor uh, you could get a free testosterone to cortisol monitor that you put on your on your sleeve and you could tell, oh, I'm overtrained, my cor cortisol is going up, my free testosterone is going down. But what that study shows is that when you give people carbohydrates, their free testosterone to cortisol ratio changes uh, less badly. It actually doesn't change much, doesn't have much of a negative change at all in that case. And if you want to see what my uh, blood glucose responses were to a uh, carbohydrate containing diet, I've done multiple podcasts with Kara from NutriSense and shared my continuous glucose monitor readings. So this one is also fascinating. Modification of immune responses to exercise by carbohydrates, glutamine, and antioxidant supplements. Along the same lines, consuming carbohydrate, but not glutamine or other amino acids during exercise, it attenuated the rise, which means it put a, a ceiling on the rise in stress hormones, such as cortisol. And it appears to limit the degree of exercise-induced immunosuppression at least for non-fatiguing bouts of exercise. Evidence that high doses of antioxidant vitamins can prevent exercise-induced immunosuppression is also lacking. Whole separate discussion. Having more carbohydrates in your diet, especially consuming them during exercise, resulted in an improvement in stress hormones after exercise. I think it's hard for anyone to argue that carbohydrates don't have a benefit in situations like this. These are the benefits of carbohydrates. You don't want post-exercise immune suppression. You don't want post-exercise huge spikes in cortisol. This will limit your progress long-term. Having carbohydrates helps with this. I didn't always 
understand these results, but this has been part of my journey going down the rabbit hole as I lost my religion of ketosis over the last few years. It's not to say that I don't appreciate some benefits to ketosis and how it helps us understand the molecular mechanisms of obesity, satiety, and uh, nutritional uh, paradigms I, that are ideal for humans in general, but I don't think it's ideal for humans at all. One more study that I want to talk about here is quite fascinating. The effects of diets high in protein or carbohydrate on inflammatory markers in overweight subjects. So what you find here is that the dietary carbohydrate protein ratio had no effect on inflammatory markers. Body fatness is positively associated with levels of serum CRP, but you can limit carbohydrates or you can limit um, protein. And there were no differences in inflammatory markers, meaning that carbohydrates don't appear to be inflammatory in humans, especially when you're trying to lose weight. This is a study with 50 overweight subjects randomly assigned to ad libitum, either fat-reduced diet, high in protein and low in carbohydrates, or a high-carbohydrate, low in protein diet during six months of strictly controlled dieting. There were no changes in the inflammatory markers. Carbohydrates are not inflammatory. Now, that study didn't even really control for the quality of carbohydrates. They weren't just using what I might consider to be the best, quote-unquote, sources of carbohydrates. They were only using probably standard carbohydrates, grains and things like that. And it still didn't show any differences there. So anyone saying that carbohydrates are inflammatory, I've yet to see evidence for that unless they're doing a little bit of hand-waving and nutritional reductionism. There's one more study that I want to show that I found pretty interesting, testosterone and cortisol in relationship to dietary nutrients and resistance exercise. The R values for some of these graphs are not incredibly impressive, but uh, look at the serum testosterone and the percent energy in the diet by fat. Okay. As you go from 7.5, which is a very low fat diet to 30% fat, that's a reasonable amount of fat to have in the diet, probably close to what I have. Testosterone goes up. The R squared value is 0.51. Okay. Saturated fat, pretty clear. R squared is 0.59. The more saturated fat you have per day, the more your testosterone goes up. The more monounsaturated fat you have per day, okay, more testosterone goes up. All right. We don't necessarily hate monounsaturated fat. I just like saturated fat more. R squared is 0.62. But look here polyunsaturated fat to saturated fat ratio. As the amount of polyunsaturated fat increases, right, you get a bigger number here. Serum testosterone goes down. The R squared is 0.39. So not as good as some of these others. But then look at the percent energy in protein, right? As you get to super high levels of percent energy from protein, the serum testosterone goes down. And then the protein and carbohydrate ratio is quite fascinating to me. Again, this is a fraction. So more carbohydrate is more in the denominator, which means this number is going to be smaller. Serum testosterone goes up as there's more carbohydrate and less protein in the diet. That is a R squared of 0.35. So the fit is not great, but those are some interesting trends to consider from a lab that is a fan of ketogenic diets, that being Jeff Volek's lab. So we've looked at a lot of science in that little whirlwind. I want to summarize that. I'm not a fan of ketogenic diets for humans, unless you have intractable epilepsy or neurodegenerative disease. I think that the benefits of appetite suppression can be gained by eliminating seed oils and you will get all of the other benefits of insulin from eating fruit and honey. Things like glutathione, hormones, electrolytes, exercise, recovery improvement, ratio of free testosterone to cortisol, less immune suppression or amelioration of immune suppression post-severe exercise bouts. All of the signs point to improvements when you include carbohydrates in your diet. My perspective is that there's an important nuance here. I'm not a fan of processed sugar. I'm not a fan of grains. I'm also not a fan of potatoes. So where do you get your carbs from? I've chosen to get my carbohydrates from fruit and honey. Some in the nutrition space, space some in the nutrition space, both in and out of the ketogenic world, would, can, <clears throat> would compare 
these simple carbohydrates to processed sugar. I've done multiple podcasts and explained this at length, but in the end of this podcast, I want to show literature corroborating the notion that there is a definite physiologic difference in the way your body responds to processed sugar and fruit or honey. Before I get into that, I want to show another study which I found very compelling. And this is in response to those in the nutrition world, or at least the ideas in the nutrition world, that you should keep your blood sugar below a certain level. Because some people may hear this and say, but won't eating fruit and honey spike my blood sugar? Yes, it will. Why do you care? Show me one good study that really proves, that really illustrates that raising your blood sugar like that is causal. There's an association between higher levels of blood sugar, but are these just people who have baseline metabolic dysfunction and that is why their blood sugar is spiking postprandially? So you're seeing the metabolic dysfunction. Is it the high sugar? I don't buy it because look at me, look at my labs. My hemoglobin A1C is lower than 98% of carnivores out there. I guarantee you my hemoglobin A1C, the average blood sugar I have over the last 90 days eating 300 grams of carbohydrates on a lot of days is lower than most ketogenic dieters. Explain that. Riddle me that, please, okay? I'm not getting excess glycation. I'm not damaging my endothelium. My HSCRP is low. My fibrinogen is low. You can find all of this in the blood work podcast. My fasting insulin remains low. So this study, I think, is impossible to ignore. The relevance of glycemic index, glycemic load for body weight, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. What you find is that the strongest intervention studies typically find little relationship between GI and GR, GR being glycemic response, essentially glycemic load, and physiological measures of disease risk. Even for observational studies, I'm quoting from the abstract, the relationship between glycemic index and glycemic load and disease outcomes is limited, right? Thus, the abstract I'm reading, it is unlikely that the GI of a food or diet is linked to disease risk or health outcomes. Other measures of dietary quality, I agree with that, not this next statement, such as fiber or whole grains, <laughs> disagree with that, maybe more likely to predict health outcomes. But yes, dietary quality, fiber or whole grains, no. But I'll read that last statement again. Thus, it is unlikely that the glycemic index of a food or diet is linked to disease risk or health outcomes. That is a strong statement. If your blood sugar goes to 140 milligrams per deciliter after you eat some pineapple and honey, with your meat and organs, celebrate it <laughs> because that is insulin at work. That is insulin affecting your hormones positively, affecting your glutathione positively, affecting your kidney positively. That is not disease process. There is a, and I use this word carefully, there is a cult within the nutrition world of keeping your blood sugar below a certain ceiling. I've pointed this out before, but I have heard preeminent people in the nutrition and health space say, a quote, don't care what you eat as long as you keep your blood sugar below a certain value. And that to me is just travesty. That to me is wrong. And uh, again, I hope to have conversations with those, with those people uh, in the future. But to say to people, I don't care what you eat as long as you keep your blood sugar below a certain value misses the point of food quality completely. And I don't think there's good evidence for it like that study I showed you. So let's move on to talking about evidence that I see that corroborates the notion that honey and fruit are not the same as sugar. I've done whole podcasts on this in the past. I'll continue to talk about it now. Here is a study from Rick Johnson, uh, and I'd love to have him on the podcast in the future. The effect of two energy-restricted diets, a low-fructose diet versus a moderate natural fructose diet on weight loss metabolic syndrome parameters, a randomized controlled trial. The basic takeaway is that weight loss was higher in the moderate natural fructose group, and each out intervention diet was associated with significant improvements in secondary outcomes. So both diets were calorie restricted, but adding back in moderate amounts of natural fruit to a low fructose diet did not abrogate any of the benefits in terms of metabolic syndrome in these patients. If you look at the actual data here, you will see that the amount of fructose they were consuming from fruit is significant. 
So this is the uh, number of calories from fruit on these different diets. So on the 1500 kcal diet, there were 480 calories from fruit. On an 1800 calorie diet, there were 540 calories from fruit. Uh, like 30-ish percent on both of these diets of their calories were carbohydrates from fruit. That's a lot of fructose. Didn't result in any changes in their metabolic parameters or loss of any of the benefits of the overall process fructose reduction, which is probably why we see results like this in animal models. Substituting honey for refined carbohydrates protects rats from the hypertriglyceridemic and peroxidative effects of fructose. I would love to see the study in humans. I would love to see honey and fructose head to head. They're not the same. They don't behave the same in animal models. They don't behave the same in human trials. Look at this human trial on red orange juice. Red orange juice improves endothelial function and inflammatory markers in adult subjects with increased cardiovascular risk. What about all the fructose in this? What about all the postprandial glycemic index spiking of blood sugar? Don't worry about it. Seven-day consumption of red orange juice ameliorates endothelial function, reduces inflammation in non-diabetic subjects with increased cardiovascular risk. This is a randomized controlled trial in humans. Where are the harms of fructose? This doesn't even really have fiber in it. And there are many in the space um, who would say, okay, fruit is fine. Uh, Robert Lustig was recently on a podcast saying, you can eat as much fruit as you want. It's the fiber that's beneficial. But then you see studies like that with red orange juice there's no fiber in red orange juice. I don't think it's the fiber. I just think that fructose performs very differently in an informational matrix. This is a little hand wavy, I know, but we don't fully understand this in nutrition, but it appears to be the case. Fructose performs very differently in those matrices of whole foods than it does in isolation. Don't have processed sugar, but don't fear fruit and honey. So what should you take away from this podcast? You should go eat a freaking mango is what you should do. <laughs> or a papaya or some grapes or some honey. Don't become a fruitarian you will severely limit your intake of nutrients. But don't fear carbohydrates. But eliminate the processed sugars, which do appear to have very clear negative effects in humans, and eliminate the seed oils. Focus on dietary quality. I'm a huge fan of animal-based diets. Organs, fresh or desiccated, meat, fruit, honey, and raw dairy. This, I believe, is the way to human health. Is it the only way? No but I think that it works for the majority of homo sapiens out there. And I think it's the best diet for humans. I really believe this is an evolutionarily appropriate diet for humans. Are there those of you listening to this who don't eat just organs, meat, fruit, honey, and are doing pretty good? I bet. I'm sure props to you, but are there people suffering who are stuck, who could benefit by cutting out vegetables, by cutting out grains, or by adding carbohydrates back into their diet in the form of fruit and honey? Yes, there are. And it is for those people, it is for you guys that I do this work. I'm doing it for the people who are not thriving. If you're thriving, don't change a thing. I'm doing this for the people who are not thriving. I try not to be dogmatic as much as possible. Do I think this is the answer for every single human? No, there's going to be some variation, but I think it's going to work for a lot of people. And I think Western medicine needs to move toward thinking about food as the major lever of improving disease outcomes and for maintaining health and achieving optimal health. And animal-based diet is how I do it. I think you guys will benefit. Join us at Heart and Soil. You can go to heartandsoil.co. If you need some desiccated organ supplements, you can go to animalbase30.com. Join us for August free Animal Base 30 challenge. Maybe you're keto and it's time to join us for Animal Base 30. You're going to like that fruit and honey. All right, guys, that's, what, that's it for this one. Thanks for listening. Catch you soon.